everybody. Welcome to today's current seminar. Today we have one speaker, one talk. Our speaker is Carl Lake. He will be giving a talk um, on a Python module for easily and efficiently solving problems with the theory of functional connection, TFC. Uh, Carl Lake is a robotic technologist who works in the DARTS lab at NASA's Jet uh, Propulsion Laboratory. He earned a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Embry-Riddell Aeronautic University in 2017 and a PhD in aerospace engineering from Texas A&M University in 2021. He is currently working on aerial mobility simulation for sample recovery helicopters and flexible multibody dynamic simulation for the SLS and other space vehicles. His research interests include uh, flexible multibody dynamics, TFC, and anything fun at the intersection of aerospace engineering and computer science. With that introduction, the floor is yours. Now you can start your presentation. Awesome, Naz. Thank you so much. Um, so as Naz mentioned, today I'm going to be discussing a Python module for solving problems quick, quickly and efficiently with the theory of functional connections. So quickly here means in terms of developer time, like the amount of code that you need to you know, write in a script in order to solve a problem with TFC. And efficiently here refers to like computational efficiency. So in terms of the you know, wall time it takes to actually run your code. Um, so before I really begin here, I wanna just give a special thanks uh, to Professor George Kanyadakis and Dr. Mario DeFlorio for setting this up and, and Naz and Zangren for, for helping me get everything scheduled. I want to thank everyone who's contributed to the TFC module in any way. So in terms of, you know, actual code commits to the GitHub repository and also feedback and ideas um, and comments that have helped along the way. And finally, I want to give a really special thanks to these two people, uh, Professor Daniele Montari, who was my PhD advisor and the man who taught me all about theory of functional connections, and also Dr. Hunter Johnston, who is a really good colleague and close friend and who also uh, contributed heavily to the TFC module. A little bit about myself, I got a bachelor's from Ember Riddle in 2017 and a PhD at Texas A&M in 2021. Um, I've been working at JPL since, and Naz mentioned a lot of the, the projects that I've been working on. And when I'm not in the office, if you can't already tell from the pictures on the right, I like to go and play outside. Okay, so on to the actual talk. So. The motivation behind uh, the, the Python TFC module. So the theory of functional connections or TFC is this function interpolation framework that allows one to turn constrained optimization problems into unconstrained optimization problems. And there are a lot of benefits for using this framework. Um, the first and most obvious is you can use simpler optimizers or optimization functions since you no longer need to you no longer need the optimizer or optimization function to handle the constraints. Those are handled by TFC and the constraint expression. You can get more accurate solutions. You can get quicker solutions. So lower number of iterations in your you know, nonlinear solver and then ultimately a lower wall time in your solution time. And it's also more robust to the initial guess. The main drawback when it comes to numerically implementing the theory of functional connections is the difficulty. And the reason that this is difficult is the constrained expressions, especially when you have a large number of constraints or you're dealing with uh, a multivariate problem, um, taking all of those derivatives, like let's say you're solving a differential equation, you may need to take multiple derivatives of this constrained expression and then ultimately a Jacobian of the residual of your constraint expression with respect to the parameters that you're trying to optimize. So you have a lot of derivatives to take of potentially large functions. So that's definitely one, uh, hurdle to, to implementing this numerically. And the other, especially for newer users, is creating the constraint expression in the first place can be a bit error prone. Um, and so the TFC Python module is designed to help solve these problems. And as I'll showcase later, there's a couple of other goals that we have with this module as well. So a quick outline for the talk. Uh, of course, to kind of understand the you know, Python module for theory of functional connections, you're going to need some background on theory of functional connections itself. So I'll give a review for those of you that have seen TFC before. And for those of you that haven't, this will serve as a very quick crash course uh, to understand a little bit about it, enough so that you can understand the TFC Python module. Then we'll get into kind of the philosophy. This will really drive a lot of the design decisions we made when, when coming up with this module. Uh, and then we'll talk about the module itself. I'll talk about the documentation and we'll go over kind of some of the tutorials that were there. 
Uh, we'll look at some code, and of course, we'll show a lot of demos as well. OK, so I'm going to dive right into the TFC review, or if this is your first time, a, a TFC crash course. So TFC, Theory of Functional Connections, all uh, operates around this notion of something called the constrained expression. And the constrained expression is a, a mathematical functional or a higher order function that represents all possible functions that satisfy a set of given constraints, right? So for this little animation that I have here on the screen, the black line is the output of the constrained expression. The two blue points are absolute value constraints. So the black line needs to pass through those two points. And then the, the red values here are like a relative constraint. So the black line should have the same value at the beginning and at the end, right? And Obviously, there's an infinite set of functions that satisfy these constraints, and I'm just moving through a subset to kind of create this little animation here. So let's take a look at what these constrained expressions are, right? So in the most general form for a univariate problem, you can write the constrained expression like this. And I'm going to kind of break down what these individual pieces are, and we'll kind of talk about how they work. The first is the free function, or g of x. So this is any real valued function that's defined at the constraints. This is the thing that you change to kind of move through the possible set of functions that satisfy the constraints. The next uh, piece that you see here on the right are these fee terms. These are called the switching functions. And the important property to note about them is they're equal to 1 at the associated constraint and 0 at all other constraints. And the final piece are the projection functionals, rho, which are designed to actually project g to the set of functions that satisfy the constraints. So this is all a little bit abstract, and I think this is really much easier to understand with a concrete example. So that's what we're going to do next, right? Let's take a look at one of these constrained expressions and look at how these pieces operate. So suppose I have some constraints here. I've got two absolute value constraints and one relative or one uh, derivative constraint. And we'll start by looking at the projection functionals. Now, I'll kind of talk about how these are derived later, but for now, let's just go ahead and take a look at them. Right, so like, for example, if I take this first projection functional, which is equal to 1 minus g of 0, if I add it to g evaluated at the constraint point, which is x equals 0, you'll note that regardless of g, I always get the constraint value of 1. And there's a similar property for the other two projection functionals as well. Right, so these things do the actual projecting of the free function g to the set of functions that satisfy the constraints. The next piece that I discussed were the switching functions. Again, I'll kind of talk about how these are derived later, but for now, here is a valid set of switching functions for these constraints, right? If we take a look at the first switching function, for example, evaluated at the three different constraint points, you'll see that it's equal to one at its associated constraint and equal to zero at all of the other constraints. And when we combine these things together, right, so these are those switching and projection, switching functions and projection functionals that I showed on the last slides, right? We're combining them here into the full constraint expression. And if we evaluate this at one of the constraint points, so for example, at the first one, x equals zero, we can see how these all function together, right? Like the second and third switching functions go to zero, the first switching function goes to one, and what we're left with is g evaluated at the first constraint plus the first projection functional which as we showed earlier, leads to the constraint value of one. And there's kind of a similar thing that happens for the second and third constraint as well. And so you can see, regardless of how we choose g of x, so long as g of x is defined at the constraints, we're always gonna get our, our constraints satisfied via this constraint expression. Right, and I can kind of do the same thing that I showed at the beginning and just you know move g uh, move through a bunch of potential Gs and make these little animations here, right? At the bottom, I, I've got the constraint expression, and you can see the two uh, absolute constraints here. And on the right, I have the derivative of the constraint expression, and you can see the, the constraint point also shown here as a, a black dot. So TFC... Uh, can, can, I ask, can I ask a yeah. Can you play yeah. the movie again? Because I, what is this um, this continuous uh, the the blue and the cyan, whatever the color is? Yeah. So so this is just kind of to showcase that g of x can really be anything so long as it's defined at the constraints, right? So we have these these discontinuous ones here, 
So like G can really be anything. It doesn't even have to be smooth, for example. Now, obviously I've taken some work here at the, the derivative, right? To just like pick either the derivative from the left or the right at those discontinuous points. But this is really to showcase that, that there's really no restrictions on G here. G can be any function. So on the right, you, where's on the right uh, movie, where's G for the discontinuous cases? So the, it's the same blue and cyan lines. Like I said, for the derivative, since it's not defined at that exact point, um, I've either just used a frame before or afterwards, uh, oh, or I've taken the derivative from the left or from the right. Yeah, because you're right. The derivative is not defined at that exact point. But oh, you don't uh, show the so, continuity. OK, I got it. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, and you can see oh, kind yeah. of like, the, I mean, this may not come across on Zoom. But if you look at these blue and, and cyan lines, like they sort of ratchet up suddenly from frame to frame uh, because the derivative is, is suddenly changing. Uh, but that may not come across on Zoom so well. So Carl, this is Suku from Davis. I had another related question. Mm -hmm. So for G, so G of uh, G comma X at one should be continuous, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. it should, that one should be continuous to get like an actual uh, value out. And of course, as these discontinuities pass through one, either I've skipped that frame because you would get, you know, not a number or, or something that's undefined, right. uh, or I've just right. taken the derivative from the left or the right. So in, the, in this problem, you're sort of interpolating data and derivatives, right? Sort of in one dimension to, to three points. Yeah. Essentially, yeah, exactly. right? Exactly. So you, yeah. can't, you can't you think of this like a Hermite interpolation sort of problem? where your switching functions are basically the basis functions, right? I don't um, know if that makes sense, but. Yeah, I would have to think about that a bit more. Um, yeah, I, I'm not super, yeah. super familiar with Hermite interpolation, so I think I need okay, to okay. Uh, okay. before I get a, a good answer. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so TFC revolves around this idea of a constrained expression, right? So far, I've basically just shown them. I haven't really shown how to derive them. That is not super important for the scope of this presentation, right? I'll flash on the screen here real quick that we have a sort of step-by-step -step procedural way to derive these. Um, but since this talk is focused on the TFC Python module, I'm going to leave this sort of derivation bit to a lot of resources that are already out there. Um, so we've got journal papers that talk about them, dissertations, a textbook that talks about them, as well as like videos of, of um, uh, of like PhD defenses as well that, that showcase all of this in a lot of detail. Uh, and going through this in detail takes a lot of time. So in the, in the interest of getting to the TFC Python module, I'm going to just say for now that there is a really nice step-by-step -step process to deriving the switching functions and projection functionals. Uh, the sort of only difficulty you really have is inverting a matrix. That's the most complicated step here. Um, so this is pretty simple to use from a, a user perspective. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and skip this for now, but just say, hey, there is this step-by-step -step process you can use to define the constraint expression, right? And in the interest of giving a good review of TFC, like it's important to say that this isn't just about doing things like deriving constraint expressions and then using them to solve problems. Like we've done a lot of work in terms of like theorems and proofs as well in terms of understanding what these constraint expressions are, right? So the obvious, you know, proof you would want is Prove to me that for an arbitrary number of linear constraints that this actually satisfies them regardless of G, right? And again, I'm not going to go through this proof step by step because we have lots of resources out there that will do that. Uh, and you don't necessarily need to understand this proof to understand the TFC module, Python module, or the decisions made to, uh, to create it. But just to kind of say that this is there. And these proofs span you know, a wide variety of things, not just the stuff you need to solve problems, but also just general research like, are these things surjective, meaning like, do they cover the set of all possible functions that satisfy the constraints? Since I'm going from g of x, which can really be any function, to a smaller set, which is just functions that satisfy the constraints, it seems obvious that it should be not unique. But can you prove that and show that? And then other things that are used to, like, for example, take this from you know univariate or, or one independent variable uh, constraints to, to multivariate constraints. And, and the projection functional sort of theorems and proofs are used to do that. Right. Hey, so Carl, like, Carl, yeah. Just one question. This is Raj from Brown. So how do you handle inequality constraint here? Inequality? Yeah. Yeah, so we can handle some sets of inequality constraints. Um, but but basically, uh, yeah. 
I'll, I'll leave that again to the other like resources that are out here because I don't have good slides. Like I can try to describe it in words, but I don't have a good slide that goes along with it. But essentially you can use uh, some sort of uh, change to the projection functional to make it happen. Um, so like you can imagine if you wanted something to be completely continuous, you could use like a sigmoid uh, to basically force that to happen. Uh, you can also use like an actual discontinuous step to make it happen as well. And basically what you have is is those projection functionals turning on when the inequality constraint is violated and, and forcing G back down to a, a value that meets that inequality constraint. And then when it's not violating the inequality constraint, that, that function is basically doing nothing. It's no change. Um, but again, like I, I realize that is not maybe super helpful just given in words. So again, there are like, if you go look at like past videos or, or at, at journal articles and stuff, we cover that in, in detail. Um, but for the purposes of this, I'm, I'm really just hoping to get to the TFC Python model. So I won't say a whole lot more than that, if that's okay. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so um, this extends to multivariate as well. Like there's an example here. Again, I'm going to show this without uh, all the steps to derive the constraint expression and stuff, because again, I'm going to leave that to other talks in the interest of actually getting to discussing the TFC Python module itself. So um, again, for those of you who you know, have only seen TFC briefly, or for those of you that haven't seen it, I'm gonna kind of go over the process for solving a differential equation with this, um, because I think that this will really highlight some of the problems that you would get when trying to implement TFC numerically, right? So the way that we normally go about uh, solving a differential equation, right? Consider like a sort of generic uh, PDE written here on the left, right? So you're going to take your, your PDE plus your constraints, and you're going to create your constrained expression from that. And when you create your constrained expression, the, you really kind of eliminate this dependent variable u, and the dependency is now on that free function g. The next thing that we would do is pick a form for g that, that we can basically solve a finite set of parameters. right? So you can imagine like a set of polynomials, like Chebyshev polynomials. You could get something. Uh, more exotic, like support vector machines or neural networks or extreme learning machines. But the idea here is you choose a form for G where there is some finite set of parameters that you can vary and ultimately use to, to optimize, you know, whatever it is you want to optimize. Of course, in the differential equation, that's going to be something like the residual, uh, but you can imagine for a generic optimization problem, it's to optimize whatever your loss function is. Right? And so at this point, the differential equation is now really only a function of the independent variables and those uh, terms. I'm just calling them psi, but these are those finite parameters that you, you can use to, to modify G. Right? And for, so for a differential equation, we're going to want to eliminate the dependency on the independent variables. So we'll choose some subset of points in the domain that we're going to solve for. And at this point, you really have like a loss function that you want to and so, you know, to do this, right, I'm going to solve my constraint expression. I'm going to take potentially multiple derivatives of that constraint expression, depending on the order of the differential equation that I want to solve. And then ultimately, again, this kind of depends on the optimizer you use. But if you imagine for something simple, like nonlinear least squares, you're going to need Jacobians of this loss function with respect to the parameters of size. So there's a lot of derivatives of potentially complex functions here. Right? And this was one of the, the main things that I said was a, a hurdle for users implementing this their first time. Or even for experienced users, as you get to more complex problems, right? you can have pages of derivatives that you need to, to somehow enter uh, correctly into whatever program you want to, to solve this numerically in. Uh, and that's definitely a, a challenge. So how can we eliminate that? And again, for, for newer users and, and even for experienced users at, in complex cases, creating the constraint expression and then copying and pasting it correctly into your, your code can, can also be an issue. So how can we eliminate this as much as possible is, is a lot of what drove us to create this module. And hopefully now that we've reviewed TFC a little bit, you can see and, and imagine a little bit easier why this might be, be difficult, especially for something like a higher order differential equation. But to give some like concrete examples, here's some, some problems that we have solved using TFC, right? So for this one, uh, we have like this tandem balloon problem where we want to solve for the shape of this, this exterior balloon here. It's governed by these set of coupled four differential equations subject to some constraints. And here, the beginning of the domain is also something that we need to solve alongside these constraints, right? So this is a pretty uh, 
challenging problem just in the terms of like the amount of constrained expressions we need to solve and take derivatives of and, and couple together and ultimately take a Jacobian of all of those things um, in order to you know, solve with something like nonlinearly squares. Right, so we'll, we'll talk about how the, the Python module makes this a fairly simple thing to do. And a similar problem here, we don't have a coupled set of differential equations, we just have one, but it's a higher order PDE with some sort of complex constraints. So you can imagine how long the constrained expression is, then you need to take tons of derivatives of that to create the residual of your differential equation. And then ultimately take a Jacobian with respect to all those psi parameters, the parameters that you use to vary G. Uh, in order to solve it, right? Again, we'll show how the, the TFC Python module makes stuff like this easier. Okay, so we've already talked about this goal a bit, right? We want to eliminate these common problems. And when you think about taking derivatives in a computer, a lot of people will jump right to finite differences, right? It's, it's a good method to get uh, fairly accurate derivatives. The problem is, at least from a research perspective, especially when we were first starting out, if we had a problem where our you know, solver wasn't converging, we had all these questions like, is the solver not converging because there's an error with the method, in, in, an error in our code implementation, or is it because we have some uh, you know, sort of numerical slop from the finite differences, right? The fact that these aren't perfect derivatives. Another thing we thought of was symbolic solvers, and this certainly helps in taking the derivatives accurately, but then you still have the problem of somehow transferring information from the symbolic solver into whatever code you're using, right? From your symbolic solver into Python or into MATLAB or whatever. Um, and automatic differentiation here seems like a, a, seems like a real clear winner to us. Um, so you can get, you know, uh, derivatives down to like numerical precision or, uh, you know, like the precision of whatever you're using, doubles or floats. Um, and also you don't have to do this, this transfer, right? Like this can be done directly in whatever program you're using. Um, so automatic differentiation seems like a real clear one address, both in terms of accuracy of the derivatives, so eliminating the problem with finite differences, and the fact that you don't need to do this large transfer of a ton of code from some symbolic solver into some you know, numerical uh, solver. Um, and so this, this is really like the, the main driver behind TFC. And then later, uh, we got some feedback that, hey, like I'd really like uh, from, from our users, which was, hey, I'd really like some help creating my constraint expressions or checking them. So we created a constraint expression solver as well, which I'll, I'll showcase a little bit later again. Okay, the, the other thing that we wanted to do besides just, you know, providing those things, automatic differentiation and a constraint expression solver, was to make this easy to use. And this is like a weird thing to say because everyone always says they want their software to be easy to use or they want it to be user friendly. So I'm going to define it a little bit more rigorously here. What we really wanted to do was lower the barrier to entry here as much as possible for, for users, right? So if I'm trying to convince you to use TFC and you've never used it before, you have to learn a little bit of the mathematics behind it. You'd have to learn at least that sort of four step procedure that I showed earlier to derive a constrained expression. If on top of that, researchers have to also then learn a ton of new software concepts and ideas, it becomes another barrier where often they'll say, okay, I'm just going to use what I already know, like shooting method or you know, something like that. So a good example of where we kind of use this to make design decisions for the TFC module was in choosing our automatic differentiation platform. Right? So if you're familiar with automatic differentiation as a concept or some of the, you know, for example, Python uh, packages and modules out there to do it, you might be familiar with stuff like TensorFlow or PyTorch, right? Those are like two of the major ones. The issue with that is, uh, one, if users haven't used those specific softwares before, they need to go and learn that. How do I take sines and cosines in TensorFlow, right? And the other thing is for things like multiple derivatives, for TensorFlow, you have to use stuff like setup gradient tapes. Again, it's not terribly difficult but it is another thing that the users would have to learn before they can actually implement TFC. So we chose to go with JAX. And the reason for that is JAX feels identical to NumPy. And what I mean by that is your code literally looks the same whether you're writing it with JAX's wrapped NumPy or, or regular NumPy itself. And, and for the users that, that we had at the time, all of them already knew Python and they knew NumPy. Um, so there was nothing else for them to learn to be able to use our TFC module. And of course, like making stuff easy to use, uh, having good documentation and lots of tutorials goes a long way towards that goal as well. And I'll show some of those in the demo section later. 
Um, finally, we wanted to make it accessible. <clears throat> this has been kind of a goal for us in, in terms of like TFC research in general, like both the mathematical and analytical side, and, and we wanted to mirror that on the numerical side as well. So for example, on the analytical side, like we have open source publications, so you can download them for free. We have lots of freely available examples, uh, and we've had researchers who are really just excited to share it with others. Um, and so we wanted the TFC module to be no different, right? It's completely open source. It's available on GitHub. The licenses allows you to basically use it for whatever. It's easy to install, right? You just use the Python pip installer. Um, and like I said, we provide lots of tutorials and step-by-step -step examples that really walk you through how to use things. And I'll, I'll show those in, in our demo section. Um, so to kind of summarize this up, right? The TFC is a, a Python module. There is some stuff that's coded in C++, but the user never has to deal with it or compile it, right? It's a, you're, when you pip install, you're going to get a binary wheel that already has stuff compiled for you. Uh, we use Jack, so that is our major dependency. Um, it's our automatic differentiation platform. It also provides some other nice things, for example, a just-in-time compiler to make your code much more efficient. Um, as much as possible, we've made what you write in code mirror what you would write on paper. So again, once users learn the analytical framework, there is a very small number of things they have to learn in order to use the TFC in a numerical implementation. And we provide some other stuff as well, uh, like quality of life classes that help you set up basis functions and you know, get points in your domain easily and, and stuff that like, you know, helps you uh, make journal ready plots or, or easily print stuff out to LaTeX uh, for writing journal papers, right? So just some quality of life stuff is on there as well. All right, so I'm going to jump into the demo here. So I'm going to jump out of presentation mode, and I'm going to kind of hop around both in my browser and on a terminal and kind of showcase, uh, you know, how all this stuff works, right? And, you know, feel free to jump out if you have any, any questions here. So I'm going to start on the GitHub itself, right? This is where all the, the code lives. If you ever wanted to look at how we did something, you can find any detail you want, no matter how fine, in here somewhere. Um, and on the Carla, main page, Carla, Carla, I have a, I have a question. This is George. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So this is both for ODs and PDs, or just ODs? For ODs and PDs. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll show some of that in in some of these demos here. Um, okay. So yeah, you know, if you look at the README, right? There's an installation guide, which I mentioned is just pip installing the module, like you would any other Python module. The real thing I want to kind of dive into here is the reference documentation. Um, so I mentioned before that we have a lot of tutorials that will basically walk you step by step uh, through how to use this. So I want to kind of showcase some of those here, right? So this is your like landing page when you get to the reference documentation. You just click on the first tutorial. It's going to start walking you through immediately. How do you use the univariate uh, TFC class to do things like create basis functions, uh, which will ultimately be the building blocks you need to solve an ODE. Right? And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because I'll spend a little bit more time on the ODE one next. You can see like this is just a Jupyter notebook that we've, we've got an HTML printout of here. It walks you through with Python code describing exactly what you're doing and why, exactly what design decisions are being, or you know, choices are being made and why in terms of you know, number of basis functions and number of points. Right? So these really are designed to help you learn to use the TFC module. Um, and again, you can kind of go through these step by step, or you can you know, use the list on the left here to choose what you want. But I'm going to take a look and, and take a little bit of time to discuss the ODE one. Uh, but you can see there are ones for PDEs, uh, systems of ODEs, solving ODEs on a complex domain. Um, so there's lots of, of good examples that are in here. So the reason I really like this notebook is I think it highlights a lot of, of what I've mentioned in the talk before. right? So we have some ODE up here at the top and a set of constraints. And this particular ODE has an analytical solution, which is nice because we can use it to compare, you know, basically how accurate the method is at the end. Again, like this is just a Jupyter notebook that is, you know, basically has an HTML output here. Um, and so you can see the Python code that we would write directly to solve this. Um, so here we're setting up the, the univariate TFC class, which again is sort of a convenience class that will easily give you you know, different uh, basis functions if you want them. It can give you uh, points in your domain in a specific way. So for example, if you're using Chebyshev points, um, there is a, a specific way to lay out the points that will give you the best numerical results. And we already have that stuff sort of programmed into the class for you just for convenience. 
the stuff that I really want to talk about is, you know, sort of the, the hurdles that this TFC module is helping you overcome here, right? So <clears throat> I mentioned that Jax looks like NumPy, right? And if you haven't seen Jax before, this is essentially what you do. You import Jax.numpy as NP, the same way that you would normally just do import NumPy as NP. Uh, and then you can use this exactly as you would use NumPy, right? You can see here I'm taking exponents, you know, like I would, or signs like I would. Um, so this is really, really nice for our users since they don't have to learn anything new. The other thing I wanted to talk about is the fact that, again, this mirrors as much as possible what you would write on paper. So here's the constraint expression that you would write on paper for the constraints above. <clears throat> and you can see, like, this is what that constraint expression looks like written in Python. Again, like, it's, of course, not exact. Like, you have to call out, you know, numpy.py rather than pi itself, right? Things like that. But again, if you're familiar with numpy already, this as much as possible looks like you know, in numpy speak, what you would write on, on paper. The next thing I want to show is how easy it is to take derivatives, right? So for this particular ODE, it's not super complex. It's got a second order derivative and a first order derivative inside of the, the ODE here. And if I want to take derivatives of this constraint expression, why? All I have to do is import this element wise gradient from tfc.utils. So this is coming from the tfc package. And this is how you take your derivatives. Right? This is all you have to do. And then you can use these exactly like you use your constraint expression function, and you'll get the derivative out. So when we're writing the residual of our ODE here, it looks exactly how you'd like you know, write the residual on paper, of course, translated sort of into, into numpy speak again. Um, but this is you know, as complicated as it gets, uh, or as simple as it gets in terms of writing these. Right? So this eliminates uh, a lot of the complexity. And then you can go ahead and solve it, right? Again, you can use you know, whatever solvers that you want. We provide some that are, are common and, and easy to use, stuff like a nonlinear least squares. This has some bells and whistles under the hood, right? It'll pass your constraint, it'll pass your loss function through Jax's just-in-time compiler to make it more efficient, for example. Um, but you could technically use you know, whatever solvers that you want. What, what, sorry, sorry, Carl. What, what are the options? Because there are not many options, right? It, it, you have to go with least squares. Uh, you could so so. I mean, really, this is like at this point, you basically have an optimization function in terms of xi, right? So in the TFC module, we really only provide some least square solvers. But if you had other solvers you wanted to use, you could use those instead. So for example, um, we had some problems where we wanted to use neural networks, and then we wanted to use specific optimizers. Uh, and that were not least squares, and we could use those instead, right? I mean, it's really like at this point, as long as your optimizer can modify parameters of xi and and you know use like this loss function, you can use that that solver instead. Okay, and you can import you can import the solver. How do you get that solver that is not in the library? So, so when I, yeah, so if it's not in our library, like any solver that will work with numpy, right? So like I could import solvers from SciPy, for example, and use those here. The, the downside is those SciPy solvers won't pass through the Jax's just-in-time compiler, right? So you won't get that computational efficiency. Um, but, you know, you can use those. Jax also provides some nonlinear solvers that you could use as well. Um, so you, you could use those too. I mean, we found for the problems that we have that least squares and nonlinear least squares is, is enough. Uh, but if you have something more complex that you wanted to use, you could absolutely use that too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, essentially anything that you could normally interface with numpy functions in code, you could interface with, with this instead. Right, and the rest of this notebook is basically just analyzing the solution, right? So this, this gives you the solution here, and then here we're printing out, you know, error metrics and, and the runtime and stuff like that, creating some plots, right? Um, so that's here. Now, I mentioned that these are Jupyter Notebooks, which is really convenient because if you're a new user to this TFC uh, Python business, and let's say you want to like just play with some stuff, you can just download it, right? So I can download this as like a Jupyter Notebook. Um, so that's what I'm going to do here. And then you can open it yourself and make tweaks to it, right? So um, I just downloaded it here. Let me... So I can open this now just as I would open any other Jupyter Notebook, and I can start playing with things, right? So like, let's say that you wanted to see what would happen if instead of using you know, basis functions up to degree 30, you, know, you wanted to use basis functions up to degree 10 instead. 
you can just like any other Jupyter notebook, make the changes and then you know, restart and run, run the notebook. And if I look at the bottom here, <clears throat> give it a second or two, um, you know, again, like the error is worse, which is expected, right? I've used less basis functions. I'm going to get a less accurate uh, solution, but it solves a little bit faster. So if we look at like the one that was on here with 30 basis functions, we had something like, you know, precision on the order of like 1e e minus 16, and it took about two milliseconds. If we use fewer basis functions, we got error on the order of like 1e e minus 7, but it took, you know, sub milliseconds to solve. Uh, one question. Uh, this thing gives you the basis function as a matrix. I mean, that you can use it outside or you? Yeah, it gives you it as a matrix. Yeah, so th this TFC class that I talked about, this like UTFC class, it gives you this, this value, uh, this function H, which you pass in some points and it'll give you a, a matrix of the basis functions at those points. But it would be like an ampere array matrix, like uh, similar, uh, right? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, and yeah. besides besides the Chevy Chefs, what else you have for basis? Yeah, so uh, that's actually a great question. Uh, and so I, I think I really like this question because it kind of shows you, I'm going to show you how you would find the answer to that here, right? So there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, one way to do this, right? Like let's say I was just writing some TFC code, right? And uh, so I wanted to you know, import the UTFC class. One thing that's really nice is we've done as a good a job as we can of giving you good doc strings and also good type hints, right? So um, for example, the basis functions have, have these values, right? And, and if you're familiar with some of the normal abbreviations, uh, these are things like Chebyshev polynomials, Legendre polynomials, Fourier series, and then these stand for different extreme learning machine implementations, right? So these are the ones that come with the class, right? Of course, you can use your own, right? If you wanted to write your own basis function, uh, or use some very specific basis functions that are not here, you can write your own, right? But if you want to use these, they're already here for you. Um, so it's like, you know, convenient if you want to use these, and if not, you can write your own basis functions and still just use things like automatic differentiation and, and solvers that we provide. Um, so you can kind of plug and play with, with which pieces of this you use. I mean, oftentimes our users will use all of the TFC module, right? Because as I mentioned before, you know, this is on the order of like, 15 to 20 lines to solve an ODE like this in a, in a very short amount of time. Um, but, you know, if users want to, you know, research into, you know, some very specific basis functions that we're working on, or they have an idea for their specific problem, want to use something different, like it's pretty flexible in the sense that you can use your own to, to do that too. Carl, Carl, so the, the solver, if you go, go back to what you had, the, 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 all, all these choices, right? No, no, you mm -hmm. the, uh, Extreme learning machines, uh, Relu, and so on. I, I saw yeah. it there. Uh, yeah. The uh, Swiss. That so it's so, so these are all different versions of VLMs, right? With yeah. The, yeah. And then and then the CP is just a spectral method, right? C CP is just Chebyshev polynomials. Yeah, spectral. And yeah. then LEP is what? Uh, Legendre polynomials. And FS. But Fourier series. Fourier series. So okay, so it is spectral methods. So right now the library has either spectral methods mm -hmm. or the um, random projections with different. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, can you add uh, pins, for example? Can you add uh, um, physics-informed neural networks? Can you add any any of that? Is yeah. That... So you can. Add, so you you can do neural networks. The the sort of uh, caveat that I'll mention is when we did full neural networks, just program using like jax.numpy, things were a bit slow, but I also did that a few years ago. Um, jax uh, now has a bunch of rich like neural network frameworks that go along with it. Um, so I haven't explored those myself, but it, it's possible that those will be quicker. Uh, for maybe, a lot of the maybe, neural network stuff. Oh, maybe we can ask uh, Raj. Raj, you think that uh, this, we could enhance this library just by adding pins there? Yeah, I think uh, he can use Equinox, one of the ecosystem projects. Uh, it can be added there in the Equinox. Yeah, Equinox. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. that is yeah. a pretty much Jack's best system, and it has a very nice algorithm to filter the non-array and the functional in the workflow. Like when you concatenate three layers, so it is composed of the linear weights and the activation function. So mm -hmm. activation function you have to leave out in terms of taking the gradient with respect to parameters. So that they provide a filtered transformation that can easily weed out the, the differentiable array. So I think you can look into the, we can look into the Equinox uh, that as a 
ecosystem on top of this. So, yeah. Yeah, and in those cases, like if you want to use something like a Jax neural network uh, library, like I know there's Flax and a few others out there, and, and maybe you even want to use their solvers and stuff, right? You're welcome to use, like, you know, you don't have to use the UTFC class in order to use the TFC module, right? You can just use pieces of it, um, and, and, and that works as well. Yeah. So, Carl, you mentioned that Jax SciPy doesn't JIT compile. Uh, I don't think so. It can be JIT compiled. It can be. Yeah, it can be. Uh, Jax has this just-in-time compiler. Um, yeah, yes. And the SciPy from the Jax is a JIT compiler. Yeah, the SciPy is, but they don't necessarily have all of the SciPy solvers, or at least not the last time I checked. Maybe they've added more since then, but the last time I checked, there was only one or two of the SciPy solvers that they had uh, transformed into the Jax.SciPy that can actually pass through the just-in-time. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. But because I remember that I use Jax SciPy solver, which is did compile actually so yeah yeah so there's also you can use that that too yeah mm -hmm. uh and all it, it's worth mentioning here if you are familiar with jacks all of our basis functions are uh like they have all the transformations in order to be able to you know do the just-in-time compilation as well right so like the basis functions that i mentioned earlier what you're actually getting out is is the c plus plus basis functions right obviously there's like a well we use swig but you can use you know pipeline or whatever there's like an interface to, to python right but these have a C++ implementation. And if you're familiar with Jack's primitives and stuff, like we do all the XLA transformations and stuff um, so that these can work directly. Uh, with, uh, with uh, and th those are already differentiable, right? Like if I pass my function, it will be differentiable. Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. H, H is differentiable, yeah. So you, you can call, you know, Jack's uh, Jacobians. I mean, it's a matrix, right? But so like you can call Jack's Jacobians or you can do egrad or you know, whatever you want on it. Oh, awesome, yeah. thank you. Doing that too. Right, like when we do when we do e grad of uh, of of y here, uh, we're taking gradients with respect to to x, right? And so we're going to get ultimately, you know, a derivative of h of x in there, um, since since g of x is is in y. Yeah, cool. Um, so I'm running a little short on time here. Um, so let me let me kind of there's two other things I want to I want to showcase real quick. Um. The one is the constraint expression solver, right? Uh, so that was the other piece that I kind of wanted to mention. So this was added after uh, the original release of the package. So Mario was a big uh, help in, in both coming up with ideas and, and, and providing feedback on, on how best to do this. Um, so this one is a symbolic solver, right? This is not designed to be used. Like you don't take the output of this and put it directly in your code. Um, this is really just designed as, as a tool that works with the TFC. You know, it's on the TFC Python module, but doesn't necessarily work with the rest of it. Uh, but we just use SciPy, a symbolic solver in, in Python, to come up with these constraint expressions here, right? So here we're, we're Im implementing you know, two pretty simple constraints, right? Uh, but you put those in here and you can just get the constraint expression out. Again, we have different print types. There is a TFC print type, which will get you close to something that you can copy paste into your code. Uh, but you'll often have to make minor tweaks to this. Uh, we also have other nice printers like LaTeX, for example. So if you solve a constraint expression here and then want to throw it in, in a journal paper or a conference paper or whatever, we have a, a LaTeX printer. SciPy comes with a LaTeX printer that, that you can use. Um, and then, you know, of course, like I said, like we don't just have simple tutorials, right? We go through complex tutorials as well. So there's a multivariate example here and a complicated multivariate example that includes like integral constraints and stuff like that. Um, so there's, you know, kind of as whether you're solving simple problems or complex problems, there's usually a good tutorial to, to get you started. The other thing that I wanted to mention is you're only seeing, you know, a handful of tutorials here, let's say 10 or 15, right? But we have, we have many, many more than that. Uh, one of the nice things about this GitHub is we created it while we were creating a lot of the analytical framework as well. Um, so there are specific folders in here that have all the examples from, from major publications, right? So for example, the TFC textbook has, you know, different problems and examples in every chapter. And we have those problems and examples given here in the, in the GitHub, right? So for example, like we also have this for dissertations, right? So if, if I, for example, grab my dissertation and find a problem that I really like, um, so like, let's say I go to my list of examples here, and you go to example, I don't know, two nine, you see this multivariate problem and you see, oh, like this is really cool. I'm curious how they created these plots. I'd like to see how they implemented this in TFC. If you just go into the you know, associated directory, right? So if I go to my dissertation, chapter two, example nine, 
you have the code right there that you can play with and use and modify and tweak. And vice versa, if you find an example that you really like in this examples folder and you want to learn more about it, you can go to the associated paper and or, or publication and, and learn more about it. Um, so we have you know, just a, a really, really large amount of examples here. Uh, to help you learn this, and also, you know, if you find one that's close to the problem you want to solve, to use as a template, and, and you know, just tweak a little bit. Um, the other thing I was going to show is a, a live demo. Uh, so maybe I'll do that real quickly here. So I'll we showed like that balloon problem before, right? Uh, so I'll show that here. Um, so basically when you run these, it's, you're going to see a brief pause at the beginning as it's compiling, right? That's as it's passing through the just-in-time compiler. And then it's going to do a printout here, right? And then, you know, ultimately here we decided to plot these values. This is kind of a, a picture that you saw earlier in the presentation. Um, and again, these are easy to tweak, right? So you might notice something weird here. Like these, these printouts were coming in at less than a second, but I'm getting an average time of four seconds, right? I go in and look at this, that's because in this case, like the nonlinear least squares uh, thing that I was using is using a very specific timer type. It's using process time, which measures CPU time. Um, and so like, let's say you wanted to change this. Let's say you wanted to measure wall time instead. Again, you can, in whatever editor you have, so I happen to have NeoVim open, but whether you use VS Code or Emacs or whatever, um, you should be able to get this information via your LSV, right? I can go and learn more about timer type, for example. Um, and it says here, you know, timer type is a, is a timer from the time module, right? So if you already know Python's time module, you might have heard of perf timer before, um, or perf counter before, right? That's just their high performance uh, timer, right? So I can go ahead and change this, and I should be able to get this to run with uh, wall time instead, right? And if I look at the time now, instead of four seconds, I see about, you know, point two seconds, which is more or less what I'm seeing, you know, the print has come out of it. Right, so we, from everything from like good LSP hints to code documentation to tutorials, and try to make this model as, as easy to use. And of course, if you have other ideas to make it easy to use as well, you know, please please let us know. Um, that GitHub that I mentioned has you know issues that you can submit, or we also have like a discussion section uh, where people will submit questions and answers, and you can see we've got a few of those here. So you know, feel free to to, to interact. With those of us that write this DLC module as well, if you have ideas to improve it, make it better, or make the documentation more usable. Okay, I'm already a little bit over on time, so I'm going to just kind of finish up here with, with conclusion real quick. Uh, so to summarize, right, we have this TFC module that helps you solve problems in Python, it, problems in Python using TFC quickly and efficiently, right? So quickly here means that there's a low number of lines of code to write. Efficiently means computational efficiency. Um, we aim to alleviate the problems that we saw when users were applying TFC numerically, specifically problems taking derivatives, which we saw with automatic differentiation, and problems solving the constraint expression, which we solved with that symbolic constraint expression solver. Uh, we also wanted to lower the barrier to entry, so we chose things like JAX to make this really easy because most of our users already knew, knew NumPy, so it was a very uh, easy for them to use you know, JAX.numpy instead. Uh, it's completely open source and comes with tons of tutorials and examples, and I've really only showed a few of those here. So in terms of future work, at this point, the TFC module is essentially in maintenance mode. So unless users are submitting specific feature requests or, or documentation improvements, I'm essentially just maintaining uh, you know, minor changes so that this works with JAX, right? So as JAX makes changes upstream, I'll, I'll make minor tweaks to the TFC module to keep it working with the most recent version of JAX. Of course, if you've got ideas or things that you want to add, you know, please let me know. But at this point, it's got all of the major features that, that I think should be in there. The other thing that I've considered is a port to Julia. Um, I don't think that's necessary, but I think it's something that could be interesting and potentially useful. Um, but I'm kind of waiting to see what happens with the, the diffractor uh, library there before I, I really consider this more happily. So that's all I have. I want to thank you all for your attention. And please let me know if there are any other questions. Thank you so much, Carl, uh, yeah. for your great presentation. Thanks. So now we open the floor for questions. Do we have any other mm -hmm. questions from the audience for the speaker? Who is talking? I have a question, Carl. Uh, can you show us a PDE example? Yeah, sure. 
Um, so I showed some kind of in the presentation here. Uh, do you mean like a live PDE example? Let's say uh, let's say I want to I want to solve the Poisson equation on on a sphere. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I have one that will take a while to compile. Like the JAX library takes a while to compile. But I have an example in kind of an exotic domain here that we showed in the presentation. Um, and I can maybe just run one real quick so I can find one. Uh, we go to the way to create it, for example. So I'll let this run again. Some of these PDE ones take a little bit longer to compile, but this one was pretty quick. Uh, and then I've got some plots here, right? So this is the solution. This is a specific like wave equation PDE. So here's the solution and here's a plot of the error, which is like order one E minus 15. Uh, and I can open up the code if you'd like as well. Uh, it looks pretty similar. Instead of using that UTFC class, we use this MTFC class, which stands for you know, multivariate uh, theory of functional connections. Here I'm, I'm sticking with, uh, let's see, I've got like a Legendre polynomial and it looks like there was also an option to use ELM tan H, like an easy switch to use ELM tan H instead. Uh, and then this is pretty similar, right? So here I'm solving for the constraint expression. Um, I'm taking some derivatives, uh, forming the loss function. And then uh, this one's a linear uh, PDE. So I'm using least squares rather than nonlinear least squares. Uh, and then there's some stuff at the bottom here to-, to, to uh, So yeah, so my question here would be, what would be the difference if you use the Legendre polynomials versus uh, using the ELM 10H? Yeah, yeah. So again, I, I mean, I would direct you to the. I'll give a brief answer here, but I would direct you to like a lot of those pub other publications which have a lot of this stuff spelled out in detail. Uh, it's very problem dependent, right? About in terms of which basis function is going to work best for you. And um, the idea here is that the TFC Python module makes it really easy to play with, right? So I, I could try solving this on the XTFC ones and see how they, they do for this particular one. Um, whether they take longer, whether they have more or less error. Um, so for this one, it looks like the solution time is about the same. The error here is, is a little bit less with the XTFC than the Legendre polynomials. But this could also be a function of the number of you know, basis functions that I've chose. But then here's that same solution, which of course looks basically the same. I mean, you can't tell by eye error at the level of 1e e minus 11 or 1e e minus 15. And here's a, a plot of that, that error as well. Right. And how about the inverse problems? Let's say for this problem, I wanted to find the wave speed. Can I, and I have some data. Somebody gives me some data of the solution. Can I find the wave speed? How do I set this up? Yeah, I mean, so I'm going to actually direct this to Mario and, and George here real quick, because they're, they're the experts here on, on PIN and, and also like more so than I am. I haven't done a whole lot of inverse problems. Um, do you guys want to talk about real quick how you would use TFC to do this? And I can talk about how the Python module would help. Yeah, I think the implementation for an inverse problem will be pretty straightforward. Uh, you just have to add the, the losses on the data together with the differential equation and adding the your unknown uh, parameters or function as a other constraint expression or basically just a, a, um, an expansion of the polynomials or uh, or the neural network and then optimizing the parameters and finding their solution. Uh, I don't know uh, uh, how it will be easy with the with the TFC uh, module. Well, I, mean, I, mean, Mario, I, mean, with the, I know I know you can do that. I meant with a module. Uh, what changes do I have to make to the module yeah. to solve the inverse problems? Not, not yeah, to... so, yeah. Oh yeah. You know what? So uh, it sounds like what Mario said is basically you need to get an expansion of your unknown parameters. So you would have maybe some changes. It sounds like to the XI parameters, right? Like you would have some extra. Uh, values for the XI parameters that you would also need to solve so that list would get longer um, and then use a, a solver that would handle those. And, and I don't know about the inverse problems if there are specific solvers that you all use, if you use nonlinear least squares as well, or if you use something more exotic. Uh, but again, you know, whether you use TFC Python module for that or not would, would maybe kind of depend on the solver that you want. Again, this should work with any solver that will work with NumPy. So if those are working with NumPy, then, then that's great. If not, then you know maybe there'd be a you know, different thing you'd consider using. Okay. I have another question, Carl. Um, sure. uh, related to the question that George asked you, if you can use a physics-informed neural networks uh, with this model, I saw yeah. that uh, among your codes there was one using a deep uh, TFC. 
which is yeah. basically a simple neural network with the uh, with the constraint expression implemented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is is that code with the with the TFC module or is uh, something else? It is, yeah. So I think the I don't know if I can find this quickly, but um, yeah. So anything that was in the dissertation, which would include stuff that that has DTFC, uh, will be in here. So when I wrote the dissertation, which is now like a few years ago, uh, a bunch of the 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 neural network stuff was was like Jax was just getting started, right? So there weren't a lot of these frameworks that worked well with Jax. So I think some of the deep TFC stuff, if you look, it might be using TensorFlow. Um, this one looks like it uses the, the TFC module, but you might find some that use TensorFlow as well. Um, and that's just because of the age, right? At that point, like Jax was just getting started. It was really useful for like the basis function stuff, uh, but a lot of the corresponding neural network frameworks weren't there yet. Um, and so in, in terms of like computational efficiency at that point, it was much easier to use, to use TensorFlow. At this point, I think that that's a different story. Uh, but I haven't gone back and, and retried those. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. Thank you. But I, I would say that this is, in general, a rich area for research and exploration, right? Like, a, a lot of this, like I said, was written a few years ago, and it hasn't been touched a whole lot since, other than to add that constraint expression solver. Um, so if users are familiar with, like, Flax or some of the other jax based uh, neural network frameworks and want to try interfacing this, I think that that's something that, that could be very useful. Um, this is another reason that I consider the Julia port as well. Um, because their just-in-time compiler should work with any native Julia code, whereas the just-in-time compiler on JAX is really restricted to stuff that's been programmed in a way that JAX can, can interpret. Um, but again, Julia, I've been sort of waiting for, for this diffractor library to pop up. Uh, Carl, when was this developed? What, what year was the... Or so, what the JAX version that you were using? Uh, so right now we work with the most recent JAX version, but a lot of the examples when I wrote them, like if I went into that that example that I just showed, like you know this deep TFC stuff was pushed like four years ago, and there was some update eight months ago, but it's probably a very minor update just to kind of keep this this working. But I haven't gone back and and you know rehashed a lot of these and and kind of done them from scratch with with newer features, right? So um, yeah. I see. So, so the deep deep TFC. Who developed that? You or in your thesis, or somebody else in uh, Daniela's group? Yeah, yeah, no, no. So Daniela and I worked on that together. Yeah, yeah. So if you see that, there's like a deep theory of functional connections paper. That one was written by Daniela and I. And then there's some stuff in my dissertation as well that that utilizes that too. And yeah. also, I think Mario told me that uh, um, there was a fractional OD. Uh, uh, yeah, that's something that Daniela has been working on. I'll, I'll let him talk more about the fractional calculus stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's something he's been working on. But it's not in the TFC, in this module, right? So, so, I mean, it's something that, the reason that that is not necessarily in here is because fractional derivatives are, are something that's not supported by JAX, right? Like, I, I mean, I, I don't remember, Daniela, how you did the fractional derivatives, uh, if you did finite differences or something else. Um, but yeah, but, but there are other... You know problems that you can solve with TFC module that are obviously not not in here. If you want to know, it costs you ten dollars. <laughs> uh, how about a, a good Italian dinner, Daniela? Yeah, actually, I'm uh, preparing uh, uh, Anna Patriciana, Carly. If you want to join, the... <laughs> yeah, I'll fly over. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Uh -huh. Maybe George during May, I'm a little bit more free and maybe I can visit you guys. Sure, anytime, anytime. But uh, you know, we we, um, we have a very simple uh, approach to taking derivatives, including fractional derivatives, all by sampling. So all the all the derivative, all the fractional derivatives can be done by me, Monte Carlo or quasi Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. so you don't need to do the L1 derivatives and the uh, uh, GL derivatives and so on anymore which would require a grid. So that can be done all by sampling. And then uh, also the integer derivatives can also be computed using the Stein's identity. All divergence by Laplacians, curls, everything can be done by sampling. So, so you can change everything to sampling. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's something that like, you know, again, if you wanted to use the module kind of as written here, you could grab something like basis functions out maybe if you wanted to use them, but then you might do derivatives in your own way, like you mentioned using like the Monte Carlo sample. Okay, okay. Great, Thank great. You. Yeah, thank you so much. Do we have any other questions uh, for the speaker from the audience?
So with that, I, I think we don't have any more questions. Thank you for your uh, great presentation and thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's time to close the session. So have a great weekend, everybody. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Carl. Bye-bye.